What's the problem? Well, we talked about it a little bit just before we got started, um, but online harassment and abuse can be an enormous problem, and it's one that platforms have had a lot of difficulty addressing in a way that makes the community feel that they're being listened to, but also helps combat the problem. This is a quote from Dick Costello, he's the CEO of Twitter, talking about the sort of rampant issue of how do you deal with online harassment and abuse on your platform when you don't necessarily have control over the individuals who are involved in the harassment. It's not a workplace issue, you can't visually see them and talk to them, pull them aside and say, this behavior is inappropriate or intolerable depending on the scope of the nature of the harassment. Really what you have to deal with are technological means and as we'll discuss later, community norms. 40%. According to a recent survey, 40% of online adults have been the targets of one or more types of harassment. You can see from the chart that there's a variety of different harassment and this particular study was designed to ask adults to identify with one of these. The likelihood that an adult had been involved with one or more of these is an even higher percentage. So who is involved with online harassment? Who are the people who are harassing? Who are the people being targeted? Well, there's a correlation potentially between the types of people who engage in online harassment and where that harassment takes place. So let's start with the who. You can see from this chart that a lot of these people are strangers. They have no relationship to their targets. And I'm gonna use the word targets throughout this talk rather than victims because in some cases that's the preferred nomenclature for people who have been subjected to harassment and abuse and I don't want to discount the, their desire not to be identified as victims. But in a lot of ways, it also goes to the heart of that a lot of this harassment is not targeted at a particular individual for a particular reason. It really is, they are a target. They've been identified for some reason. Sometimes it is a personal characteristic, but other times it's just because that person is around and active on a platform and they become just sort of fixated by one of these harassers. Um, and so I'm gonna be using the word target throughout the talk. So if you're a target of harassment, it looks like you're most likely to be a uh, targeted by a stranger, um, but there are also former partners and family members who can be involved in this type of harassment. So where does harassment take place? A significant amount takes place on social media. And while these are not necessarily uh, causation, it's not necessarily that a coworker is more likely to harass you on an online dating site, but there is a correlation that there's potentially a likelihood that a stranger is more likely to harass you on social media. And there are a lot of reasons for why that might be the case. I've created a platform permeability matrix to sort of outline the ways in which how a platform is designed can contribute to the types of harassment that are likely to occur on the platform. So if you think about opened versus closed, who has control over the access between different users on the platform? And on this side, we have users who have the most control, and on the other end, there's platforms. And you can also think of this by user interface versus by design. A comments section on a blog or another website is going to be open by design because there aren't a lot of ways to curate or otherwise moderate a comment section. You don't necessarily, there are certainly tools like Discus that require you to have a login and that sort of information which makes it almost like a microcosm of a social media website on the comment section of a platform. But in other contexts, it's an online community that can be closed by users. For example, you can think about chat services and social media. Those can be changed or shifted based on user preferences, but there's always going to be a certain degree of openness. Whereas text messaging can be closed, but that's both by platform, because email is generally a more closed method. Unless you have your email publicly available uh, on the internet, or it's associated with your workplace or your work address, generally people can't get your email address unless you give it to them. But that's part of the design. That's not something that a user can control in terms of their email. They have flexibility with giving that more publicly, but that's not how the platform is necessarily designed. So how? How does online harassment take place? So I've put together a taxonomy of online harassment to walk through the different types. Because if you are a platform, before you can start working towards solutions, or a designer, or any person who's involved with trying to combat online harassment and abuse, it's important to think about what you're trying to fix. Are you dealing with rampant anonymous hate speech as some social media platforms and messaging platforms are currently dealing with? Are you dealing with um, a different type of gendered harassment? Are you dealing with something different, another type of flood of just general spam? These are all ways to conceptualize the types of harassment um, that can take place. It's certainly not an exhaustive list, but hopefully it will be a good start for us to have 
sort of a common grammar around the types of harassment that are, are pretty common online, and particularly on social media platforms. Uh, so dogpiling. Think about throwing a bone at a dog park. You might be just trying to get your dog to go after the bone, but there's a pretty good chance that another, some, a terrier or something else belonging to another person is going to run after that bone as well. And when you have multiple dogs running after the same bone, that can really bury the bone. And unfortunately on social media, a target sort of serves like a bone. Uh, dog piling can be unlooping unwanted third parties into conversations. So you might think that you're having a pretty high level debate, potentially a contentious debate with one person, and suddenly tens, twenties, thirty people are now responding to you as well that were really not meant to be part of the conversation. And depending on how the platform is designed, there aren't a lot of means for you to, you know, avoid that kind of potentiality. If there's harassment, there might be ways to report it, but if there's just conversation that you were not intending to be a part of, there may not be a way for you to sort of avoid the dog pile. You're gonna be buried as the bone for a long time until the dogs basically lose interest and go away. Doxing. Now this is a very unique type of online harassment because it's the exposing of a target's personal and often sensitive information. Now this can take place on lots of different harassment mechanisms on lots of different harassment related platforms. Uh, the reason that this is such a difficult and unique problem is because it has very specific real world con consequences. And to be quite clear, all of these types of harassment can have offline, quote unquote, real world consequences. I don't really subscribe to the notion that online is not the real world, but I do understand that conceptually it's important to draw a distinction. Doxing can often lead to another type of harassment that we're gonna talk about later called swatting, but it can also lead to a number of dangerous or you know, potentially harmful activities at your workplace, your home, uh, because people can send, you know, 100 pizzas to your place and say cash on delivery. And you have no efficient way to deliver the news to these delivery people. This wasn't me. This was an online hoax because that's just not going to be something you can easily disseminate to this group of people who are standing outside with pizza for you. Um, and of course, that's a potentially a more prank oriented example um, for purposes of just categorizing, but it can also lead to, as I mentioned earlier, something like swatting. Gaslighting. Um, is anyone familiar with the origin of the term gaslighting? Good. So there was a, a play in which, to keep it very short, um, a male character continually turned the lights down in the apartment, and the female character kept saying, the lights are changing, they're changing, and the male character was like, no, nope, they're not, it's totally normal, don't worry about it, it's totally normal lights, just you being, being crazy. And that's kind of the way light gaslighting works online. It's using uh, online harassment to create doubt in the perception of the target. So you can say, this is what you said to me in a direct message, this is what you said to me in an email or an instant message, and the person can say, that's not what I said, you just, you just misread that. You're really overreacting, that's really not what happened. And that can have incredibly damaging effects if you're not willing to release the email for a lot of very valid reasons. Uh, you don't want to get totally drawn into the dispute, or it's just something that can, from a lot of people, think about this in conjunction with something like dogpiling. If you say A and 40 people are telling you that, that A never happened and it's actually B, it's a very difficult type of problem to, to dig yourself out of. And if you have not a strong support network through the platform, um, that could be a really big problem for you trying to have your voice heard in a free open marketplace uh, or a platform. Hate speech. Hate speech can come in lots of different forms. It can come in lots of different targeted forms to lots of different people. Uh, but generally, it's going to be degrading interactions that are based on the target's identity or characteristics. Often, this can be um, racial speech or gendered speech. It can be threats that are in a particular way that might be, you know, evoke a particular response in, in a certain group. Um, so, for example, posting um, threats of sexual assault or, or rape to a woman is one example of both hate speech and also gendered harassment. Posting pictures of um, you know, a noose to an African-American individual would also have the same kind of response. But these are different types of ways to get at harassment and make people in online communities feel marginalized that are based on the identity or characteristics of the individual. So this makes targeting, as we mentioned earlier, a more personal attack. The harassment there is more personalized. Jacking off. Has anyone heard this phrase before in the context of online harassment? <laughs> um, so it's a pretty, once I give you an example, I think you'll be familiar with the technique. I'm not saying that uh, Karen is, you know, a big fan of um, globalization in the terms of making marketplaces for robots everywhere over the world. I'm just asking the question, does she want to replace human labor with robots? I'm not saying that she wants to do X horrific thing. I'm just asking the question, 
was she engaged in in a crime two years ago? I'm not saying that this person is completely incompetent to serve in their job. I'm just asking the question, do you really want this kind of person working at your place of employment? And it's, in one way, a defensive technique from the abuser to distance themselves from the accusations. Some of them may be familiar with slander or, or libel laws or defamation laws, depending on the way in the online harassment is taking place. Um, and they may be thinking, oh, well, if I don't make a declaratory statement, then we're all good. And that's, one, not accurate, uh, not that this is legal advice. Um, but two, it, it also creates a distance and a way for the abuser to say, well, I wasn't saying that you did this. I was just asking the question. I can ask questions, which can lead to uh, another type of harassment we're going to talk about in just a minute called sea lining. Uh, revenge porn. So I, as Karen mentioned, I used to do a lot of research in this area. I'm continuing to do research about revenge porn. But this is distributing uh, sexually explicit images without the consent of the pictured individual. And revenge porn can be related and is often interconnected with one or more of these other harassment strategies. But targets of revenge porn often have again, offline consequences. They can lose their employment, um, they can be reprimanded at their jobs, um, they can be, you know, have all kinds of additional types of stress and harassment uh, related to the revenge porn images, but any person who is a target of these types of harassment may have similar types of stress and strain related to the harassment depending on the severity. Um, sea lining is gets its origin from how sea lions sort of just pop out of nowhere out on, uh, and lay out on the rocks for a while and you're not really sure when they're going to leave or why they decided to pick that rock at that particular time in the first place, but there they are. And sea lining in the online harassment context is popping into a conversation with endless questions. Um, I just had a quick question about uh, the origins of this. Oh, I was just wondering where this conversation, you were part of the conversation. There's really no reason for that person to be concerned about the origins of the conversation or really anything else. But it can be a tactic to draw people away from what their real priorities are. Um, often sea lining happens with sort of an innocuous question. Um, it's particularly for people on social media who post about news events. They can come in and say, well, I'm confused about why this particular thing is an issue. And you might engage in good faith, and then you quickly realize, oh no, this person was not trying to engage in good faith and learn about, you know, recent riots or harassment or you know events overseas. They're really trying to draw you into a conversation to get you to focus on them and not focus on what you would prefer or want to be doing. And that can also be a very difficult um, engagement prospect to get out of in the online harassment context because, again, if the context is not quote abusive within the language of the platforms, online harassment and abuse reporting policy. I'll also be calling these HARP throughout the talk as sort of a shorthand because online harassment and abuse reporting policy is quite a mouthful. Um, but depending on the terms defined in the HARP, you know, just engaging in incessant and unwanted conversation may not be something that you can flag or report to an administrator. It might be something that you as a user are responsible for, or depending on the platform, there may be no means of response at all. Surveillance. So this is something that can happen both on platforms and can also happen on devices. And I'm doing additional research in partnership with a, a direct services organization in this field. And it's going to be focused on how technology can be used to track a target's behavior. Now, this does not tend to come up as much uh, in the sort of stranger online harassment target context, but it does happen very part, uh, frequently in intimate partner surveillance issues. And when an intimate partner has access to a password, Many people ha use the same password across platforms. It's not practical for them to use a, a single password database or storage unit for them to have randomized high strength passwords all across many platforms. And realistically, a partner might have access to one of those. And if the partner has access to one, they might have access to bank accounts. They might have access to f different social media accounts. Um, and a, a dangerous uh, response or post from a person impersonating the individual who holds the account on a platform like Facebook to family, friends, and coworkers can be incredibly damaging. And the final one is swatting. Who here has heard of the term swatting is familiar? Good. Um, just for those of you who have not heard the phrase before or who um, just would like a, a refresher, it's the fraudulent sending of a SWAT team to somebody's home. And as I mentioned earlier, this often is sort of partnered up with doxing. If somebody's address or other personal information is posted on the internet, it's very easy to find. And in addition to sort of the more, not to say that it's not damaging or, or an alarming thing to get 100 pizzas at your house, but that is different than having a SWAT team that is fully armed show up to your house where you may have a pet, may have family or friends, may have coworkers even, and have a SWAT team show up at your door. You have no idea why they're there. Just a bunch of armed SWAT team members saying, open the door, we've heard that there's whatever type of critical situation was anonymously reported. 
And this can have, again, real, you know, offline effects in addition to potentially leading to a lot of um, sort of mental exhaustion on the part of the target to explain to law enforcement what's going on. They may decide to take proactive steps to inform law enforcement, here's what's happening to me online. Depending on how tech savvy law enforcement may be, that could be quite the challenge. Try to imagine explaining Twitter to someone who doesn't use Twitter. Uh, yeah, you can just chat back and forth on 140 characters, and some people have open accounts, and some people have closed accounts, and this egg was tweeting at me, and they, and they sent my address. What's an egg? Why are there only 140 characters? Why doesn't everyone just close their accounts? Well, that's really not a viable option because my job is related to Twitter. What kind of job do you have that's related to Twitter? And these are really the kinds of responses and interfaces that law enforcement have with targets of harassment. Um, and if you're looking for some examples of this, we were talking a little bit before this talk about Amanda Hess's pieces that appeared um, in the Pacific Standard, um, why women aren't welcome on the internet. And that provides a very helpful insight into the kinds of conversations that can be had with law enforcement who just are not familiar with these kinds of technologies. And they aren't familiar with how offline conduct and online conduct can have different effects in, in the world with coworkers, with family members, and with intimate partners. So why? I would love to say that this next reveal is going to be me explaining why harassment takes place, but it's not. Um, it's not clear. There are not a lot of studies about sort of the mental processes of a harasser, uh, particularly an online harasser and particularly a stranger who has chosen a target potentially at random and fixated on them for some reason. And the reason this is important to how user interface designers and platforms should think about harassment is because if you don't know the why, then you're focusing on how this plays out on your platform without really understanding the underlying mechanisms, which can be very challenging. And that's why creating an effective online harassment and abuse reporting policy is so challenging. Because you can't just say, well, well, they're doing it because of X, so what if we try to focus on changing X? Because there are so many different variations, so many different reasons. It would be sort of saying, well, a bunch of people are crossing the street against the light. Well, why? In that particular sense, it's more helpful to just say, what can we do to mitigate the risk and make drivers and pedestrians feel safe? Because we're observing that people are crossing against the light and it doesn't seem like we're going to be able to ask every individual person and come up with a tailored response for why they shouldn't do that. And the same thing plays out in online HARP. What you need to do is think about, okay, we're observing this behavior. We've identified the particular types of harassment that are playing out on our platform. What can we do to combat that particular type of issue? So we're going to conceptualize some solutions. So I've bucketed two different types of approaches into the legal and regulatory approach, which would be using uh, new laws or amending or repurposing old laws um, or relying on agency intervention like the FTC, depending on the type of conduct to intervene. We're gonna talk a little bit later about why I don't think new criminal laws are a good fit for online harassment in the context of revenge porn. And we'll talk a little bit more about using revenge porn as a case study for the reasons in which there might be other uh, more effective means, or if not more effective, perhaps more um, First Amendment friendly um, to combat this kind of behavior. And then the other one is a norm and rule based approach. So that involves sort of what we're going to talk more about in depth, which is retooling, revising, and reimagining existing community standards and community management. Um, and for a lot of platforms, community management is one of those things that, you know, you have your engineers, you have your designers, you have the people who are going to make the platform engaging, get user base, you know, you have the people who are doing the funds, and the sort of community management aspect is one of those things that you see on an org chart that you should have, so you have one, but you're not really sure what their job responsibilities should be, you're not really sure how they fit into the organization, and that's certainly not true of all online platforms, but I think that that can be a real issue for early stage startups who are looking to enter into a social media or messaging space who have not really thought about, okay, well, what if everyone starts posting hate speech on our platform? What is our response going to be? And you do not want to be having that conversation with your staff and your employees when it's already happening and you're getting news attention. You want to have that conversation prospectively. And, in, you know, sometimes that's not possible. Um, there are a lot of really big platforms that are dealing with this online harassment and abuse, and they are now thinking very uh, deeply about what they can do at this point now that it's happening, not necessarily to turn back the tide, but try to give their community members more effective means to fully participate in that community. So these are some ideas um, based on other types of unwanted online behavior that have been effective. And when I say other types of online behavior, I'm thinking about spam. 
Think about the early 90s on your AOL account, how much spam, just a truly horrendous, crushing amount of spam you used to receive. And now, not only do you rarely receive spam, if you receive spam, it's immediately segregated into its own folder away from other things, and you delete it, and you never look at it, and you don't have to hear about a Nigerian prince's $1 million royalties. You just don't really see that anymore. And that's because, both because of legislation, but also prior to the legislation, a lot of platforms were saying, listen, we're seeing users complain that this is not what they want to see. We have to come back with ways to sort of distinguish ourselves amongst our peers and figure out a way to reduce this unwanted online behavior. Another example is copyright infringement. A lot of platforms dealing with copyright infringement have said, you know, this is something that we are having to deal with on a daily basis. We're dealing with takedown requests. We're also just dealing with, we don't want to be a platform who's known for piracy. That's not what our brand identity should be or what we want it to be. And they're doing it as more of a, a business move. And I know that it's it can be kind of a cop-out to say you should care about online harassment and abuse reporting policies as a platform because it's a good business strategy, but it's true. Um, there are platforms and comment sections that are known for being particularly uh, friendly and delightful and open. Um, one of the great examples is the toast. If you read the comment section on the toast, it's really truly an extension of the articles that Mallory and Nicole put together. And part of that is because the people who work for the toast sit and manually sift through a bunch of garbage comments and remove them because they think that that's important for their user base. They have made that a priority. And the toast is now known as a place where the comment section is not just friendly, but actually sort of a pleasure to read. Um, and very few people think that the comment section is a pleasure to read. So let's look at some of these examples. Contextual algorithms. This is something that has come up previously in the copyright infringement context. So you're using context, face, uh, different types of matching strategies that are built in-house to identify what may be copyright infringement. You may want to use the same sorts of things for online harassment and abuse. If you see this type of string of words within this type of string of words targeted to this type of user, you can pretty safely assume that that's hate speech. Or if you see this type of phrases in this type of proportionality with this number of users who are all related in other ways, you might want to assume that that's a dogpiling situation. There are ways to do al to sort of build algorithms to look at the context of what the speech is and identify or flag without having a user manually go through and identify those as a problem. Community governance is another important one. This is more sort of more common in the forum context where you have a moderator uh, who's in charge of dealing with disputes. In the Wikipedia community, there's a number of different ways to deal with disputes, the highest court of which is the ARBCOM. Um, but there's you know a community buy-in, if you will, to say, not only do we want to make the community get better, but in some ways we are responsible for making our community look the way that we want it to look. Censorship. And it's up here because I know that a lot of people might say, well, censorship is bad and we should never do censorship. And I'm generally very on the side of we don't necessarily want to prevent certain phrases from being used because if you don't have a good, well-calibrated algorithm or a good, well-calibrated way to use that, you're going to block out speech that is actually not abusive or harmful. So think of the word bitch. There are a lot of ways in which the world bitch can be used. It can be used threateningly, menacingly, alarmingly, but also between friends. And if you're dealing with censorship and you're just saying, well, we've identified these words that are often parts of harassment, so we're going to block these words, you're going to block out speech. And that same thing comes up with a lot of particularly um, speech that is used by marginalized groups. Women, LGBT community, different racial and ethnic groups use particular speeches, which is in some contexts a slur, but amongst their community can be used as a source of empowerment or sort of saying, signaling to other people in the in-group, this is how I want to be identified. And that's a very difficult thing to deal with for a platform to just say, we're going to block all of this content. But for certain speech, it may not be necessary. Uh, you may decide as a platform, you know, we see this particular phrase that has sort of developed out of our community a lot. And we know that it doesn't have, you know, legitimate uses in our co community. It's not used as sort of a, a phrase by any of the marginalized groups who use our platform. We're going to safely say that this particular word we can block and you just can't use it. Filtration. Filtration is more of a community-based strategy that would help the user say, here's what I want to see. So rather than saying, nobody can use the word bitch on our platform, it would be saying, I as a user don't want to see any content that uses the word bitch. Um, and there's a lot of ways I'm sure you can imagine some of them in which that would be a helpful tool to have in a user toolbox. But that does require more personalization. And that's not necessarily something that every platform can invest in to give so many particularized tools to so many different users, depending on the size and scope of the platform. Moderation. Some of you may have read the long uh, article about how moderation can work in some places. Um, it's a very difficult issue. Uh, 
Moderation can be farmed out to other countries, it can be farmed out to other workers, and depending on the type of moderated content, it can take an incredible emotional toll. So in a, an article that appeared um, maybe last year, um, which I believe Adrian Chen wrote, he talked about the ways in which Facebook moderators that are based in the Philippines go through content and it's generally really violent. Really violent assaults, really violent brutal beheadings, you name it, that's the kind of content that's in this sort of moderation process. And imagine being the person whose job is to come in early in the morning, look through image after image after image after image after image after image, brutal, brutal images, and then go home, and then come back. And look through image after image after image after image after image, brutal images, go home, and then come back every day. And the burnout rate is just incredible. Um, so that's one type of extreme moderation that may not be sustainable for a large-scale platform. There are other types of moderation. Um, you know, for example, the toast. They are not the size of Facebook. They have a very sizable and well-respected community, but they're certainly not on Facebook's level. They don't have a billion readers. They are able to manually go through and call these contents. That's a form of moderation. Um, and that's something that some communities can engage in. The same thing goes for people who use um, sort of plugins for their comments. There are ways to set up filters on moderation through one of those portals that can help sort of relieve the burden on, on humans to do that kind of heavy lifting. Now the issue obviously with filtration and moderation is that sometimes things that you don't necessarily want to eliminate, things that are not necessarily harassment and abuse might get caught up. Um, but that may be a trade-off that a platform or a user interface designer decides they're willing to make depending on the type of platform they're dealing with. Proprietary management systems. This would be something like Content ID, which is used by YouTube to identify um, from a database of uploaded co copyrighted content what may be infringing on its platform. And it's an automated process that sort of flags what seems likely to be infringement. But that's something that YouTube developed in-house to deal with a, a copyright infringement sort of issue. That was one of the things that they wanted to focus on and they were able to invest the resources to come up with their own proprietary system for dealing with that problem. Pseudonymous or real name requirements um, can be another, requir uh, another way in which platforms implement a, a normal rule-based approach. You can pick whatever name you want, but you have to use that same sort of sticky identity across the platform. So this would avoid things like sock puppets where you have one account that's your quote real account where you're a lovely, delightful human, and then you have four other malicious accounts that run whatever amok you as a harasser have decided that you would like to run. Um, you can also have real name requirements, but as I'm sure this room knows, uh, based on some of your faces when I mentioned real name requirements, um, there's a lot of problems with that, uh, particularly for marginalized groups who, for a lot of very valid reasons, do not want to use their real name, rather because it's they don't identify as their real name or their birth name or their ID name, depending on how they frame it. They don't want to use their real name because they're scared of this kind of harassment. They don't want to use their real name because it's not their real name anymore. It's not how they're known to their friends or colloquially or particularly for um, targets of intimate partner violence or surveillance, it can be dangerous. It can actually be dangerous and harmful to use a real name. Um, and part of that is connected to the algorithms that are used on other parts of the platform that say, would you like to be friends with this person? And you're like, no, that's my abuser. I do not want to be friends with that person and I definitely don't want that person to know that I'm on this platform anymore. Um, but if you use a real name, there are lots of ways that algorithms can accidentally or mistakenly match you up um, with people that you would otherwise avoid. And settings customization. Settings customization sort of addresses a number of these other factors because you can have settings that allow you to moderate or allow you to filter or allow you to otherwise manage the content that you as a user are being exposed to. But some platforms have not necessarily developed strong settings customization to address the types of problems that the platform is seeing. So think back to the taxonomy of harassment. If your issue is with dogpiling and you tend to get it from new accounts that may, necessarily, may not necessarily be quote legitimate accounts, a settings customization that would say, I don't want anyone who's only had an account for 30 days to be able to see me. That's one way that a settings customization is sort of beyond the usual privacy settings that could address a particular type of targeted harassment for an individual user. So, we're gonna do a little case study so that you don't just say, well, Amanda, this is a great idea and, and very thoughtful and, and helpful, but um, what's the real world situation on this? So we're gonna talk about a case study in just a minute, but one of the sort of commonalities is uh, strong community norms. And I think that what's more effective than putting together a model privacy policy or a model terms of use and adding HARP to that sort of, you've got your three pieces of stock legalese from your attorney's slap it on your website sort of approach is to conceptualize it in these ways. 
Now, it's important to avoid the politician's fallacy, which is we have to do something. This thing is something, so we must do this. And we've seen a lot about this in online harassment and abuse contexts for probably the last three or four years. We have this particular problem, we're gonna do A, which doesn't address or even identify that B, C, and D are problems, but we got A. And then you have something like the real name requirement is a perfect example. We're having problems with harassment on our platforms. A lot of it is anonymous. Okay, well, we'll just eliminate anonymity on our platform. Well, there's a lot of ways around that, and that has a lot of collateral damage to, as we just spoke about, marginalized communities who, for whatever reason, may not want to use their real name. Yes, that may, quote, solve the problem of anonymous harassment, but it's not really better if you're being harassed by someone with a, with a name. It's still harassment, and it doesn't get at the core issue of why that's taking place on your platform or why that platform is currently insufficient in some way in dealing with that issue and empowering its users. Nope. All around nope. So what do I think platforms and user interface designers and other people who are involved in the HARP conversation should do? Well, first, I think they should develop, invest in developing community expectations. What is the code of conduct for Facebook? There's definitely a link somewhere that a lawyer wrote saying, here's what the code of conduct is. These are things that won't be tolerated on our platform. But there are so many diffuse individuals who use a platform like Facebook or Twitter or you know, online gaming platforms. There's a whole variety of different people who are using these platforms. But what are the actual true community values? What are the community norms? And actually, if you look at a site like Reddit, they actually have very strong community norms. A lot of things are permitted on Reddit. It's a pretty strong community norm. People know that. The issue is, I think, in the online harassment context, not that nobody knows you're a dog, but nobody knows if you're serious. So something that may be understood in a platform like Reddit, when that kind of bleeds out into other platforms, the community norms are different. And people see things that you know perhaps are even intended as jokes or playful, as menacing, harassing, and threatening. And that's not to say that you know the per any of these people are sort of, quote, in the wrong, but there's a lack of consideration about the community norms. And if there is not a strong community norm or community expectations about user behavior, that's, I think, where a lot of this spillover can take place. Um, and, and sort of not on the more extreme type of harassment, but some of the more mild, frustrating, difficult, ongoing interactions with people can be draining, and that can happen because there's not a strong community expectation. Like, don't talk to someone who tells you not to talk to them. That's a very simple community platform expectation, but there are not a lot of platforms who make that one of the values that are easily accessible and easily discernible to their users. Empower users to shape interactions. You can tell probably from this talk that I'm a big fan of customization and user settings. Um, and part of that is because I think that users have different needs. Some users are willing to engage with harassers. Some people think it's helpful to discuss with them why this is happening and come to sort of a mutual understanding about, I don't like your behavior, but you're gonna keep doing it, just not to me kind of situation. And I know that there are people who negotiate those kinds of conversations all the time online. Um, their abuser says, you know, I'm not gonna bug you anymore. It doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to bother anyone on the platform. But for some people, they wanna be able to have that power to engage and have a conversation. Some people would prefer to just shut it down. They don't wanna see it, they don't wanna know about it, they don't wanna hear about it, and they don't wanna have to spend time reporting it every time it happens. Empowering users to shape their interactions in the platform and with the community can both take a load off the platform itself because now you're saying we've given you this suite which may be small or large of customization interfaces. We're still gonna keep doing the usual flag agreeing with whatever our norms are aside from this, but we want you to feel empowered to shape your experience on our platform the way that you see fit. And empowering users to shape those interactions is a way to do that. And enforcing against disruptors and violators. Saying, no, don't do that, is, is not always effective. And, and saying, you're going to be blocked only to create a new account a couple of days later is also not effective. There have to be real tangible consequences for people who violate these community expectations. And depending on the platform, that can vary. It may be that you're suspended. It may be that you can't edit certain things. It may be that you can't respond to certain people. There may be IP address issues when blocking to make sure that there aren't additional accounts. Of course, we all know that technologically speaking, a lot of these things are, quote, easy to get around. But taking a stance as a platform can be very powerful. And when we talk about the case study in just a moment, I'll give you an example of where the platform actually made a huge decision to terminate somebody from the platform that had real world consequences. So case in point, League of Legends. Does anyone play League of Legends? OK. Well, we're going to talk about it a lot, so I'm excited. Um, League of Legends is an online multiplayer game. It's incredibly popular, millions of users. People play it for money, lots of money. When I was doing research for this, I had no idea how much money you could make gaming, and you could make a ton of money gaming. 
Um, so this is from Jeffrey Lin, Riot Games lead designer of social systems. And he took a really strong view about online harassment and abuse on the platform, which got to a point that it was pretty rampant. Many interactions were negative, many of them were threatening or menacing, many of them were harassing, and he was like, this is not, this is not aligning with my personal community expectations or what Riot Games envisions for our community expectations. So what can we do to recalibrate and bring our user base in alignment with our community expectations, what we'd like to see them to be? So he did an incredible amount of work retooling the platform. They began by asking the question, who is responsible for bad behavior in our community? And they found that there were definitely people who were just sort of, if you will, the proverbial rotten apples. They were bad and they were bad all the time. But most of the people were generally inoffensive players. So they would generally be fine, generally good members of the community, and then they would get flagged for some kind of really outrageous harassment and they would turn up and they would say, well, that's, that's unusual. That changes the way that you approach the problem because if it was only you know, if it was the reverse, if it was mostly persistently negative players, eliminating all of those players might have been the approach. But when you have generally inoffensive players who occasionally engage in online harassment, that changes the way in which you approach the strategy for creating your community norms and, and empowering your users. So here are an example of some of the um, norms and rules that we talked about earlier that Riot Games implemented uh, as part of their HARP overhaul. So contextual algorithms. They started relying on a tribunal system that learned from community feedback. So that relates very closely to community governance. They encouraged the community members to review and vote on reported behavior. So if somebody said, this person said X, Y, Z to me, I'm going to flag this as harassment. It would be uploaded to the tribunal portal. Community members could go look at that speech, that particular type of conduct, depending on the particular variance of the actual nature of the harassment, and say, we agree, this is garbage, this is not part of our community values, we're gonna say this is abuse. Or they could say, I think that this is probably not abuse, I think you're just being sensitive. Or they could just say, you know, no, this is not abuse, this is just not abuse, vote it down. So by encouraging the community to review it, they were actually able to create a contextual algorithm that reflected community norms which is pretty incredible. They were able to say, users, teach this computer to make decisions the way you want the decisions to be made. We're going to invest in the infrastructure and resources to build the tribunal itself, but we want it to learn from you. We want it to look like what you would look like. And they also designed this, the, not just the machine learning tribunal, but also reporting mechanisms. So they changed their reporting mechanisms and also connected it and explained, here's how the process works. It's not just a flag. You're not gonna use the same flag for copyright infringement, nudity, harassment, and spam, right? You're gonna have different tailored ways to report particular types of abuse, and they will be dealt with differently, and in particular, harassment and abuse are going to go up to this tribunal system, and it's gonna be reviewed by a community of your peers, and by engaging in that process, you get buy-in too. You might not be a target of harassment, but you can say down the line, I wanna teach this machine how I would like to be respected and treated in the community. And then they recalibrated the default chat settings. This is what I actually think is the most interesting. So originally, when you would go on chat, some players use headsets so that they can communicate in real time with other users using voice um, rather than messaging or, or using other signaling mechanisms. The default mechanism used to be on. You would log into your League of Legends account, you would enter, you would start playing the game, and then your chat would be on. So it would be really easy for you to sort of pop into a mission, potentially, and people start yelling at you, get out of here, what are you doing, you're screwing it up, and you know, slowly devolve into more harassing language. They just said, why don't we just make it an option? Rather than having it default on, we're gonna make it default off, and if you wanna have chat, you turn it on. So that was a way that they enhanced user control. And it had really dramatic effects, 40%. When, particularly because of the change in the default on settings, they saw a 40% drop in verbal abuse. It's an incredible amount. They almost have the amount of verbal abuse that happened on their platform simply by changing whether it was default on or default off. And given the a number of other type of infrastructural investments that Riot Games made, like creating a machine learning tribunal that learns through voting and getting community buy-in to use the tribunal to teach that machine, this was one of the simplest things they could do and it resulted in immediate effects. It also resulted in a 35% increase in positive chat. The people who wanted to use chat felt comfortable that the other people who wanted to use chat we're going to be positive about it. Because if you're gonna be a negative person, you might be doing it off the seat of the handle. You don't have that opportunity if it's default off. You have to go out of your way to turn it on just so you could engage in harassment. And as we looked at earlier, more than 80% of the players were generally inoffensive. 
So that really wasn't the problem that they were most concerned with. So this was a very simple recalibration that Riot Games was able to do, and it had immediate tangible effects on the positivity of the community. So we've talked a lot about why I think community norms are an important and valuable way to approach this. I'm also going to talk about why I think that legal and regulatory approaches uh, can present more problems than potentially they solve. And the way that I'm going to do this is by talking about revenge porn. As we mentioned earlier, this is a particular type of harassment. It can happen on lots of different platforms. The posting of the nude image can be difficult to scrub from the internet. Uh, anyone who is familiar with the Streisand effect knows that once it's out there, it can be very hard to claw back something negative. Um, as a side note and a digression from my copyright law focus, um, the Streisand effect gets its name from Barbara Streisand. Uh, she had a beautiful home that overlooked a cliffside in California and was also causing really horrible erosion. So if I remember correctly, environmental activists took pictures of her home and posted it and said, this is part of the problem. And Barbara Streisand's lawyers made the decision to send a demand letter, which rather than the one person who'd posted it and maybe the 10 people who read that website at the time, now everyone wants to cover it because they're exposing something really potentially damaging to the environment, and the response was a cease and desist letter. And it spread and spread and spread so much that now we call that effect the Streisand effect. So I think we can get a sense of how dramatically uh, negative content on the internet can prol proliferate and how difficult it can be to claw it back. In that sense, it's arguable about whether that sort of proliferation was justified in the revenge porn context, where it's purely negative, does not have you know, real value to the individual who's posting it. That can be a real serious concern. So many advocates and tar excuse me, targets of revenge porn believe that new criminal laws are the only way to combat revenge porn. This map uh, shows a chart of all of the states that currently have criminalized revenge porn in dark blue. And you'll see that in the Southwest, where I'm from, I'm from Arizona originally, in the Southwest there's this one lone holdout state of Arizona. And the reason is because Arizona passed a garbage revenge porn law. And that is the problem with passing legislation to deal with human dysfunction. And we do lots of legislation to deal with human dysfunction, don't get me wrong. Um, we do all kinds of things to make sure that people who engage in truly reprehensible behaviors are punished. But when you're dealing with something like nudity, which I don't know if you've gathered this, but can you imagine the nine people on the Supreme Court being super good at dealing with female nudity? No. In fact, there was a period in like the 70s and late 60s where they would just say, we don't really know what to do with this. We'd prefer not to talk about it. Obscenity, we guess, we don't know. This kind of issue could lead to a second version of that where you're saying, well, in some contexts, a woman's naked body is fine. In some contexts, it's bad. In some contexts, she's exposing an, a corrupt New York senator, I don't know, for example, and sending it to a media organization. Arizona's revenge porn law went even a step further, and it criminalized completely legal First Amendment protected speech. As you can see, I've highlighted some of the key phrases that made this a truly unconstitutional piece of legislation. They made it unlawful to display, disclose uh, any photograph or other recording of a person engaged in a state of nudity if the person knows or should have known that the depicted person did not consent to that disclosure. How many of you guys have kids or no kids? How easy is it for you to get like, I don't know, a one-year-old to wear all of their clothes at all times? It's impossible. So you take a picture of your kid running around with their shirt off and you show it to your best friend and you just committed a crime in Arizona if this law had been enacted as it was written. Because your one-year-old kid can't be like, mom, of course, it's totally fine. I consent to you showing Auntie Annie this adorable picture of me with my shirt off. Can't happen. And that is one of the other issues that was raised in a uh, litigation that was brought by the ACLU on behalf of Antigone Books and one of my employ former employers, Changing Hands Bookstore, based in Tempe and now Phoenix, saying, we have all these art books that have nudity in them. And we, know, we don't know sort of what the status of these books are. You know, we don't know if they consented to this used sale. We don't know if they consented to me as a bookseller selling it again. Like, we don't really know what this deal is. Um, one of the other examples that was given was, you know, some of the classic photos uh, of war, including that Vietnam, the photos from Vietnam of a girl whose clothes had been burned off by American soldiers' war bombings and, you know, other types of issues like that. She didn't consent to that photo. You know, she doesn't maybe even know that that photo was taken. Um, and in other contexts of, you know, children, Particularly, um, you know, child pornography laws have already borne out that in some cases that can be an enormous issue um, in terms of censorship. This law was not going to pass muster, and it eventually is it's no longer sort of on the legislative radar. But the problem is, even if you go in with an airtight law with the best of intent, 
it's going to get scrambled up by the legislature. And even if it goes in perfectly and gets passed, it's going to be reviewed by a judge. And a judge could say, I'm going to take a really broad approach to this law. We can look at the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is a law that was meant to criminalize hacking and has now been used for all variety of sort of computer misconduct, including most recently they charged to, tried to charge the quote cannibal cop here in New York with violating the CFAA for misusing a computer database. That's really not what the law was meant to combat, and it's being interpreted by judges to give them that latitude to do that. And you can see how a law like this could lead to the prosecution of people who have not actually engaged in misconduct. Um, and as a final example, even if you think that the person who sent a, a nude image of a senator who was engaged in misconduct to a journalist, you might feel comfortable saying, maybe that person should be covered by this criminal law. Their penalty shouldn't be high, but it is the non-consensual disclosure of a nude image, and it's certainly revenge porn in that context. Do you feel comfortable saying that the editor who receives it in the inbox, sending it to their editor is a criminal? Just saying, this is what we got in the message board this morning, I want you to take a look at it, what do you want to do? Because that's disclose and display. And that's part of the problem with trying to criminalize online harassment and abuse, is at a certain point, it's still speech. And we have to find ways to work with platforms and work with users to shape that interaction because a criminal law that says you can't say X, first, I think that it's very likely given our, our sort of US history and breadth of knowledge that it's going to be predominantly enforced against marginalized people. And it's going to create criminal acts that were not on the books before. We already have a lot of criminal laws and we also already have a lot of criminal laws that aren't enforced. So let's take a look at some of those criminal laws that might be used to combat revenge porn in other contexts. So an informal 2013 survey of revenge porn images identified sort of the origins in these three broad categories. Manipulated images, so images that had been uh, photoshopped, uh, hacked images, and uploaded images, which is sort of, the uploaded images would be the traditional notion of revenge porn. Um, somebody sends the image as sort of a, a way to get back at or, or otherwise punish the target. Now, if we're looking at this chart, well, we just talked about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and how broad it is. But this isn't even requiring any breadth or stretch of the imagination. If you hack into someone's Gmail account and steal their images to post on, I don't know, your very popular revenge porn website, you can be punished for that. Indeed, Hunter Moore, who did exactly that, recently was punished under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. He'll be going to prison. That was an existing law. He was prosecuted in California, which happens to have a revenge porn law, but he wasn't prosecuted under that law. His uh, co-conspirator is currently, I believe, undergoing sort of the the legal process to figure out where that person's going to end up. But Computer Fraud and Abuse Act just got rid of almost half of these issues. If it's a hacked image and you're able to identify the perpetrator, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act would cover that type of conduct. Manipulated images, well, they're not true. If you're Photoshopping a person's face onto a pornographic body, it's not a true image. And while it's not a criminal law, there are certain types of defamation laws that would apply to a false image. So we've just knocked out another 12%. And of this 36% of remaining images, we don't know how many of those were filmed consensually, meaning that the person knew they were being filmed. Through anecdotal evidence, we know that a lot of targets of revenge porn did not know they were being filmed. And there are state laws as well as some federal laws that apply to video voyeurism. So some other proportion, though we don't know how much, is going to be knocked out by the people not knowing they were being filmed. So what portion do we actually need to criminalize? Because we don't need a law this broad to deal with some portion of 36%. Instead, we also have 80%. Due to another survey of the criminal, uh, the, cyber, or the CCRI, which is an organization that researches and does advocacy work around revenge porn, and they are one of the organizations who's very pro-criminalization. One of their studies found that an estimated 80% of revenge porn images are selfies. And this is the part where I get to nerd about, about copyright law. So if 80% of the images are selfies, that means that the person who took the image is the author which means that that person is the copyright owner, which means that if you upload that image to a website without their consent, you're committing copyright infringement. Simple as that. And there's actually an incredibly well-developed, um, even if it's, albeit somewhat controversial, legal mechanism for dealing with copyright infringement on the internet. It's called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And under the DMCA, if you see that your copyright content is on the internet, you can send what's called a takedown. You include certain information, which is provided in a statute and say, the information of related to the image, you provide a link, you talk about yourself, you say here's what the issue is, and if the service provider wants to not be held liable for copyright infringement, they are statutorily obligated to remove the image. Now there's a back and forth process about, you know, 
was it actually a copyrighted image? Was it fair use? They can engage in that process, but you can send the takedown notice and you don't need a lawyer. And there are a lot of platforms that also have ways for reporting, including Google, that will de-index images that are copyrighted. So it might still be on a website, but it's not going to be findable through Google, say, through a future employer or a future paramour, which in a lot of senses eliminates some of the problems related to the image in that it's not findable for, for sort of intents and purposes on the internet. Now, that doesn't make the fact that the image exists go away. It doesn't make the fact that the image could sort of resurface at any moment, kind of like harassment itself. It doesn't change the fact that if you don't see it, somebody might still be saying awful, horrible, or damaging or threatening things about you. But that's a trade-off. You might be willing to say, some people might say, if I can't see it and other people can't find it, that's a stopgap measure that I'm comfortable with. And additionally, separate from law and regulatory issues, a number of websites have taken a strong stance against revenge porn. All of the platforms that are listed here have a particular revenge, policy, revenge porn policy that sort of mirrors the DMCA in that if you report an image as revenge porn, there is a special mechanism for removing that image from their platform or hiding it or disabling access depending on the particular platform and the particulars of how the platform interacts with its users. But this all goes to show that the solution is not necessarily you know, eliminating liability uh, or creating liability, rather, for service providers who allow online harassment, which has been an option. Or saying that everyone has to use a real name and then those people can be then criminally prosecuted because that doesn't have to be the two extreme polarizations saying that new criminal laws are the only way to deal with this issue. And for me, as somebody who uses a lot of these platforms and knows people who've been targets of harassment, I think it's kind of a cop-out. I think it does a disservice to some of those people in the harassment context, perhaps not in the revenge porn context, to say, this is what the attack we're going to take is. I would like to see that there should be an investment in buy-in from platforms and their designers to say, we're invested in coming up with a solution to this problem. We think it's better for us to try to find a way to serve you as a community than putting it in the hands of, say, an 80-year-old man who lives in Arizona who may not ever use a computer. So that's the end of the talk. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to discuss. Um, I hope you found it helpful. So thank you. Um, it was a great talk. You know, as you were laying this out, one of the things that I was thinking about um, is the challenges of the, the question of why, right? Which you, you know, rightfully pointed out, we often don't know the answer to it. One of the things that I found in a lot of my work um, on bullying is, is that some of the people who are engaged in um, aggressive acts in general are often themselves some of the most vulnerable um, and suffering from a whole variety of different um, experiences that are often not visible when they're positioned and understood as aggressor. Issues with mental health, um, issues with um, abuse, uh, in, you know, facing themselves, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things I've seen as a lot of this move towards trying to address harassment has been entirely under the guise of protecting um, the target or trying to make certain that the target felt safe, but not trying to figure out how to actually help the aggressor um, really come and, and, and deal with it and cope in different ways. Um, and so one of the things I've seen is there's been interesting flips on it. So I think about something like disemvoweling. Um, I assume you're familiar with disemvoweling for those in the room who are not. This is a, a common practice that was uh, occurred during blogging, which is that when somebody felt as though a comment was um, uh, problematic speech, rather than uh, removing it, which would just sort of incite more practice, the idea was to remove all the vowels, which just made it harder to read, um, disemvoweling. Um, and uh, the result is, is that it was a shaming function. Um, and it was a shaming function to go back. And there's, there's interesting battles between whether you shame somebody or whether you don't even make it possible that they know it, right? This is the blocking pattern, which is you can block somebody they don't know that they've been blocked. Right, putting but, them in the own echo chamber of their own isolation. Correct, right, right. which is you know, another strategy. The other, another strategy as it affects them is to find ways you know, as a, as a structure, which is where I, I think the tribunal thing is interesting, to try to engage with that person, right, rather than just protect. And so I'm trying to think through, as, as, you, as you think through this map, how you flip it. How you flip it as a way of targeting and thinking about um, the, perp the aggressors, not just the targets. Absolutely. And I think that one of those ways is when you enforce against disruptors and violators, I think that I didn't obviously have time in this talk to go into the ways in which you get into the enforcement mechanisms, but I think that actually League of Legends provides also a really helpful case study. Every time that they uh, enforced against a user, they would inform them why. They would say, this was reported as abusive, 
The community voted that it was abusive because you used hateful gendered language that made the person who was targeted feel afraid. Sort of an educating mechanism. Because you might think when you're calling somebody a, a bitch in a particular context, that you're just using a word that you might use in your friends all the time and you assume that they understand what you mean. But for some people, that's an incredible act of aggression and an incredibly harmful way to interact with somebody. So by empowering both the targets who are reporting the harassment, the tribunal, and also in a, some way empowering the aggressor to sort of understand rather than just being able to say, oh, these assholes blocked me, like they don't know what they're talking about, I'm gonna not take any responsibility for this, there's an informing function to say, here's what happened, here's why that violated our community policies, and here's why that particular target felt harmed. And actually when they enforced against um, an individual who I think was going to play in like the world championship of League of Legends, he was a, a sort of aggressive player who engaged in a lot of online harassment and League of Legends said, you can't play. You cannot play. You are being terminated from our platform. We're going to explain to you why. We're going to talk you through this. And his response was, oh, wow, I had no idea. I had no idea that this was the effect that my words were having on members of our community. And when he eventually came back to the community, he was like a totally different player, people said. That was sort of the report and response that people had experienced. Um, I think that Lindy West, uh, who is a blogger and well-known in, in certain spheres, she did this incredible interview where she reached out to one of her really, really harmful and dangerous trolls who had been sending messages from a Twitter account set up in the name of her recently deceased father and was sending her messages basically about how horrible she was and how she'd been a disappointment. And finally she got to a point where she's like, I have to take back this narrative. I need to figure out what's going on with you because clearly you're hurting in some way and I need to figure out why you've targeted me and see if we can come to some sort of conversation. She finally was able to speak with this troll and the troll was like, I don't, I don't know why I targeted you. I had no idea I mean, I kind of thought that it would be hurtful, that's why I did it, but I didn't really realize that it would have this level of impact. And I actually think that it's incredibly important to be, listen, I also understand that not all people can be sort of involved in like a respectful debate or conversation and not everyone's going to see the, the helpful explanation of why they were banned or why they were reputed, reported as abusive and say, oh yes, I've seen the light. Like I understand that we don't live in that world, but if there's a proportion of people who could be responsive to that kind of corrective rather than blocking function, I think that that's really important. And platforms should consider how to incorporate both target feedback into those kinds of reports, depending on whether the target feels safe being identified, but also find a way to say, listen, we don't assume, and we see this in the criminal justice system, right? Saying that you're beyond help is not an effective strategy if you don't want people to reoffend. I think the same thing applies to online platforms. Yes. Sorry. Oh, sorry, there's like a mechanism, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, it's actually linked to the tri tribunal system. So you said that the 40% decrease in the hate speech had been due only to the default on, default off uh, setting. Do you know what the impact of the tribunal was? And because it's very interesting to ask the community to define the rules and what they think is offensive or not, but I'm thinking about all the debates I've, I've seen and more and more in the past few years uh, about feminism, for instance, and what is sexist, what is hurtful or not, or about the LGBT things, and where those people are saying, oh, this is absolutely not offensive, and then a few years later, they say, oh, maybe it was, now I understand. And so if four years ago we had asked them, oh, so do you think this is offensive, and asked them to vote on that, it would have said, oh, no, absolutely not, you're just like, whining or I don't know what. And so depending on how different categories of people engage more or less with the defining of their rules, you might have something that is maybe not really effective. And so I, I don't know if you know of ways to kind of like guide that to avoid this kind of tyranny of. I do think that that's, it's an example of your point saying that sometimes words and phrases can change meaning. Um, to go back to my like legal training and IP stuff, um, there's a huge court case raging for the, the slants. Is anyone familiar with this band? Um, they're an Asian American rock band based out of Portland, Oregon, who tried to register the name the slants as a trademark, and they were denied on the grounds that it was disparaging to Asian Americans. The difficulty was that they didn't mention anything about race in their application. The examiner basically took it upon himself to look up the band and say, well, you're Asian, so it must be disparaging into Asian, so we're going to categorize it this way. But if a white person had tried to register the slants, that would never have been part of the analysis. But the sort of take there is that, you know, for some people, it's still an incredibly offensive slur. For some people, it's been re, sort of reappropriated and repurposed as a t sense of empowerment. And that happens a lot with marginalized communities taking back terms of hate and trying to either take away that hateful power or try to repurpose them into something else within their community so that they can be used. I mean, queer is a great example. There are certainly a lot of people in the LGBT com community that do not like that word. But there are a number of other people who say, that's who I am, that's how I identify. And there was another 
related trademark case called Dykes on Bikes that was about exactly that issue. Can it be offensive to some members of the community and still empowering? How do you negotiate that? And let me tell you, the Trademark Trials and Appeal Board is not where you want to be having that conversation. Um, to the extent that a platform can create something that's machine learning based, it will be able to account for changes in those kinds of habits. So if you say a particular word, let's use muffin. If muffin used to be a sort of hateful slur on the platform and over time, people in the community have said, you know what, it's so common, we're just gonna use it as sort of like a term of endearment, kind of tongue in cheek. If you keep reporting that and they all agree to vote it down as not harassment, that is a way that the machine can be taught that this is going to be a new community norm. I think what's the more difficult question is, how do you account for that when you're dealing with creating a policy at the front end of how do I encompass all of these different values, and that's just sort of an inherent problem and difficulty with designing a good online harassment and abuse reporting policy that can in some parts be sort of buttressed by having good user customization. Because then you're not saying, I'm going to pass judgment on this particular type of interaction. You're saying, users, please be free to say, I consider this harmful or damaging or harassing, and I don't want to see it, or I don't want to engage with it. Hi, I want to go back to the... Uh uh, community norms list that you had, invest in power and uh, oh, enforce? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about the utility of, of these norms across different um, racial and uh, cultural contexts. For example, if I'm a black kid living on the south side of Chicago, and one of the ways in which I cope with uh, community violence in my neighborhood is to uh, uh, project a, a persona of toughness or that I'm involved in a gang. But then you say, okay, I want to empower you not to engage in those behaviors without providing a, a strategy for remaining protected in that community. How would, that, how would this group of norms work in that context? I think that's a great question. And I think that um, I'm, not this, I'm glad that there's a lot of law overlap here because <laughs> this is sort of a nice, a nice example of how speech can change based on how it's viewed. So are any of you familiar with the recent Alanis decision from the Supreme Court? Okay, so in, briefly, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, a man posted a lot of harassing and incredibly abusive and threatening comments on Facebook directed towards his former intimate partner, and he said that they were rap lyrics. Um, and I think that rather, rather than getting into sort of the results of that decision, looking at the way that those kinds of speeches could be viewed in different contexts, in the one context as rap lyrics, and the one context as threats, can be informative here. If you are a young kid on the south side of Chicago who is sort of projecting toughness, if you end up getting reported for abuse, having an interaction where somebody says, listen, I don't know if this is what you intended, but here's how I'm taking this, might be helpful. Now, the kid might say, like, I don't really care how you're taking this. This is how I have to do me to survive. And I think in that context, then you want to find a way for those community members to find one another. So I think that Reddit is a good example of, I mean, Reddit is a good example. Yeah, it is a good example of this. There are some... Reddit threads, some subreddits, if you will, where there are a lot, really different rules that would not be normalized and would not be accepted on other Reddits, subreddits. So on some subreddits, you might be, be able to engage in her sort of harassing behavior broadly about a particular group of people, um, which would be permitted on your platform within the confines of that subreddit, but would not be permitted or you would get tagged as abuse if it sort of spilled over elsewhere. I think that there's a problem with encouraging isolationists among these views because that's how they can get more extreme. But in the context of somebody who is looking for people like them to relate about the sort of violence and awfulness that's happening in their community, finding ways to connect those people could be helpful. Um, it might be helpful, and I haven't seen a platform that's done this yet, but it's hard to figure out whether you want to bring people who are engaged in harassing behavior together in hopes that they will help each other work through whatever is happening on the platform or whether that's likely to sort of drive them to more extremism and find people with like views and sort of have that burgeon in its own way. But I think that when you're thinking about people who are not actually engaged in harassment or abuse because they are hateful people or because they actually want to cause harm to the target, explaining how that context could play out might be helpful. Um, I also think that it's very difficult for platforms to deal with lots of, I mean, they're dealing with such different demographics that cross-cultural issues can also be very difficult. Um, I know that, you know, especially as now that with one billion users, it's a lot of demographics and the types of things that might be particular from people from one country may not be, they might be considered harassing or abusive or threatening to people from another culture or the same thing in, you know, even within communities. I mean, think about women and feminism. There are lots of things that are acceptable in some sort of feminist circles that would not be acceptable at all in other feminist circles. And I think that one of the best ways platforms can deal with that issue is by thinking about it. I think that there are a lot of platforms that they aren't even thinking about that level of, of nuance that you just raised of, 
what if this person is posting what potentially looks like a threatening message because they are responding to violence in their community? Like, I don't even know that that's a conversation that's happening with a lot of designers. And, you know, they might not be able to say, here's a solution, we're going to do X. But just bringing that sort of idea into the conversation might be able to help them think in more nuanced ways about, you know, rather than saying a real name policy, we're going to have a pseudonymous policy because somebody in that room spoke up and said, here's some people that are marginalized that you are not thinking about at all. We have time for probably like two more kind of snappy questions. Okay. Snappy. snappy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for this great presentation. Um, so I guess my question, it's not a fully formed question, but you, you really showed the how different types of responses could be used for different types of harassment, right? And what I would like to push you to think about was how these different types of responses could vary depending on the platform. Because you mostly talked in your examples about platforms that put community at the center, right? Platforms for which community is very important. It's really what they do. It's what they care about. What about platforms for which community is not that important? It's kind of secondary, right? Email, right? So I'm thinking of news websites and oh. the comment section in news websites. It's like, yeah, journalists and editors, they care about comments. They would like to have a community. But sincerely, on their list of priorities, it's kind of low, right? So usually, they close the comment sections, or they like refuse to deal with it and engage with it, because they're like, oh, this is so annoying. It's a waste of our time. I don't want to deal with this. And it's a waste because it is a form of public sphere. There are like meaningful commenters. There is a community there, Absolutely. but it's just not very important on the list of things to do. So like how, what would you recommend for these types of platforms? What, you know, what would be your approach to that? I think there are a couple of different options for sort of specifically news organizations that may have a comment section, but don't necessarily prioritize it. And in terms of commenter communities, I don't know if you saw the art, the sort of meme that went around of like this adorable exchange between two older gentlemen about their days in the comment section of I think like the, the Washington Post. And they were just like, oh, I, I just popped out for a coffee. My son's coming over today. And the other guy's like, oh, I just went fishing. It was so lovely. I'm coming in for a cup. And you're like, this is so cute. I wish every kind of platform could have this kind of comment section. But if you're a news organization, and you have a comment section that you don't care about, you shouldn't have a comment section. Um, if you're not willing to invest in making, because regardless of whether or not you as a platform view it as a community, it is a way, f it's, it's an extension of your brand, right? So this is going back to reducing online harassment and abuse being good for business, right? If you don't care about developing that relationship with your readers, but you're also not going to invest the time in curating it and making it tolerable and not a cesspool of trash that people avoid, then don't have one. Um, there are other ways to encourage effective communication and conversation that's intelligent about news stories without a comment section. Um, Vice. Vice's motherboard sort of um, vertical just recently got rid of comments, and they've done a lot of really helpful, intelligible Q&As and conversations about why they made that decision and what they would prefer to see. And one of the ways is if you are a platform that does not want to be sort of a community moderator, you want to be a one-way street, provide ways for people to share the story on the platforms where they do communicate. Make it easy for them to add it to their subreddit, give a helpful hashtag that makes it easy for people to follow if they use Twitter, and people can find each other on those platforms and create a more open, different type of community. And then the conversation you're having, you know, you may miss out on some of those like random happenstance interactions, but now you're bringing the story to your community and the community that you've already developed. Okay, we've run a little bit over, so Sorry. I'm gonna make Caroline and anybody else who has a question ask you separately. Hopefully totally. you can stick around for a bit. Thank you so much, Amanda, if you guys wanna help me. Thanks, Thanks Amanda.